Greetings, darklings, from across the interwebs. It is once again I, Precious Ken, and we are back again with the Sounds and Shadows podcast. Um, today's podcast is brought to us by Bells Oberon. You live in Kalamazoo. Why not? Okay, um, I have with me uh, my compatriot, Miss Katie. It is I, Katie. <laughs> Welcome, Katie. How are we feeling? So, the energy is going to build, I'm pretty sure. I think so, too, because, yeah. as always, we have a very exciting guest. We have uh, STR Helvet. Um, say hello to everybody, STR. Hi, I'm being held here against my will. Please send help. <laughs> He's kidding. Seriously. <laughs> Um, you have uh, an exciting uh, project called uh, Helvet Inc. Um, that we've reviewed, uh, I think, a couple times now for the uh, a web page. One of which I think you went like a year in the interview or the review was out, and you didn't even know it was there, and then just stumbled <laughs> upon it some other way because you don't pay attention to my tags. No, I see. Yeah. It. You're never gonna let that go. I see. <laughs> um, so why don't we start out, tell us a little bit about just how you started out with this project and in music and um, get the ball rolling for us so people have an idea of who you are. <laughs> That's a long sorted tale. Um, I started I started with music. Uh, I don't even know. Maybe hmm, I had to have been like hmm, 20 years ago or something like that. Um, I'd always been interested in music, um, not so much as the technical aspect, but just how it made me feel and how I related to it. Um, and I started playing, uh, because I was inspired by new metal of all things, the band Kitty to be exact, uh, got me into playing guitar and, and I, I became like obsessed with guitar. Um, from there, I started my own band, uh, like this death and black metal, uh, band, um that never really went anywhere um and it kind of burned me out with music i think i was just younger and just kind of disillusioned i just figured oh you know you'll grab a guitar and you know all of a sudden somebody will hand you a grammy and that'll you know be the whiskey off to stardom and it didn't quite work that way um and i quit music for a while um and i started doing drag of all things um and I kind of gotten a name as this controversial performer. I had been like banned from a couple of places and um, I was known for doing performances that made people angry. I actually got death threats and stuff at some point. Um, uh, but then again, my drag name was Statutory Rape. So people heard the name and it was already like, okay, this isn't, <laughs> you know, well, yeah, it was kind of one of those things. Very intense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I kind of just liked playing with the idea of uh, uh, mainstream things that went on in drag and just kind of turning it on its head, um, racial taboos and all sorts of things. Um, whereas drag is kind of a platform where people just want to go and get drunk and throw dollars at, you know, men in dresses. It was right. kind of one of those things where it was my test. It was kind of an endurance test to see exactly what people could put up with. Um, because I've always been a fan of that. I've always been a fan of like transgressive artists and like Gigi Allen and Wendy Williams and like Marilyn Manson and, you know, different types of people um, and Lee Bowery and just, you know, lots of different types of people. So I tried to incorporate that, um, which I said, it was funny that uh, be, doing drag and being in a black metal band were kind of the same thing. I was wearing a bunch of, you know, leather and makeup for a bunch of, you know, drunken men in a bar, only a drag. I was getting paid a lot more for it. Um, I kind of got tired of doing that because it didn't really, after a certain point, I think I just hit a brick wall creatively um, and I wasn't as satisfied. And so I stopped doing that and I traded it for music once again. And that's what Helvet Inc. turned into um, sort of a way to say what I wanted to say and do kind of soul searching um, in a sense that I didn't get to do in other places and to be actually like, open and honest with a lot of things that were going on with me um 
you know, if if we can be <laughs> dark for a minute, because that's you know where it, that's where it came from. Um, it was just sort of this thing where it's just like. I knew that it, I was dealing with various issues, various personal problems, um, you know, uh, uh, be- becoming like diagnosed with various mental issues and things like that. And I thought to myself, okay, if I could document this and lay it all out, at least in music form, if something were to ever happen to me or for, you know, I've ever decided to eat a bullet or something, somebody at least would have a track record for, you know, I got to speak my piece and say what I wanted to say, whether people understood it or not. Yeah, no, I mean, actually, that's a topic that came up we were talking about in the Facebook group the other day, the Sounds and Shadows one of just kind of, you know, it's hard to separate sometimes, you know, we were kind of saying what conversations because it's an art and music group and everything, but like the ideas of trauma and how that affects people, how do you separate that from art and music, right? I mean, that is, it's such an integral part of it. And so I was kind of saying, it's okay to have these conversations. And frankly, we need to have these conversations. We just also, in today's modern environment, we need to kind of, I don't know, be careful and be sensitive to how that affects everybody. Because you never know how somebody takes the trauma that maybe you're at a level of being okay to express that person might not be ready to hear it. And I I think for your music, um, when I first heard it, I I caught a lot of elements of that. And I think unlike a lot of maybe more modern, I don't know, industrial sounds for lack of a better word for some of the stuff that I heard from you first, it it definitely tapped into kind of some of the older, more raw ideas of industrial, like coil, skinny puppy, a lot of things like that, that really wasn't meant like Trent Reznor talking about being sad about a girl in his bedroom. You know, it, it wasn't like that. I mean, these were intense, visceral fucking, you know, concepts and the music reflected that. So I think partially you're going to answer the next question I'm going to ask. You kind of already did, but why that? Why, you know, of all the kind of music that would speak to your soul and sounds and ideas that like, this is what you wanted to get out. Why this? So what's funny is uh, I'm probably going to piss off a lot of people by saying this, but at the time that I was getting into deciding what kind of music best spoke to what was going on in my head, um, industrial and those kind of elements seemed like the best way to go about it Um, because there were a lot of um, abrasive sounds. There were a lot of abstract things. There were a lot of samples. There were a lot of different things. And the funny thing is that before I started doing this, I was not that into industrial as a whole. Um, I was a metalhead. So a lot of um, industrial just kind of didn't hit the way that I wanted it to hit because it, you know, they're two different genres of music. So I was expecting more heavy. I was expecting more aggressive and I didn't get that. And um, it took me a while to listen to like a lot of industrial to figure out what I liked and what I didn't like and things like that. But it just seemed like, okay, this electronic kind of music that was uh, taking from industrial, it was taking from punk, it was taken from black metal, it was taken from, you know, rock music and goth music and all these little bits and pieces of things that I felt like, um, I guess, uh, sort of were the colors that, that, that painted, you know, the picture of whatever was going on in my head, whether I even like the genre or not. I've said several times, I've never really been a big fan of goth music because it always sounds like spooky surf music that got on my nerves. But for some reason, I think that's um, what I like about it. Yeah. And then, but for, you know, for certain things, it fits that purpose. And so I would just take bits and different things, which is, uh, I find it funny that people, um, often have mentioned skinny puppy when talking about me and I never really cared for skinny puppy which is the fun, which is the funny thing and I know that's going to piss a lot of people off you know they're they're amazing don't get me wrong it's just I always wanted something heavier and I think there's just this part this angry 13 year old in me that just is not going anywhere that just wants you know loud aggressive music all the time and I, I can't seem to shut him up <laughs> Yeah, I would say, like, to me, it, it's not that aspect of Skinny Puppy that I, I think I would equate with what I hear from you. It's it's more the chaotic elements. Like, Skinny Puppy, I always think of as kind of almost, and I'll probably piss people off 
with this, but like industrial jazz. Like there isn't like a four by four format, you know, four measures to a beat or whatever. It's, it's kind of just wherever it went, it kind of had a, a psychedelic kind of angle to it. And to me, that's what I hear a bit in your music is just that it's, it's a lot more free form and a lot more just on the emotional concept of sound than on writing bangers. You know, like that's just, I, that's never what I took away from you. Um, and so why don't we move into a little bit, you have a new album coming out that I want to talk about. But before we get to that, um, you did have one recently in The New Flesh. And can you tell me a little bit about, to me, I feel like both these albums were a transition of sound a little bit um, from, you know, the, the first things I heard from you. Tell me a little bit about what that transition was and what was the new sound of the new flesh for you? Um, it's kind of funny that um, when we're talking about genres and how to, you know, describe things, um, I fell into just giving my music its own name because I felt like there was just a lot of different elements and I was never a stickler for this has to be this in order to be this genre. This has to be this in order to be this genre. And that, and um, I wrote based on my emotions. So I didn't know what the hell I was going to come up with from time to time. So it was just, you know, instead of calling it goth or electronic or this or that, I just gave it its own genre, which is like, you know, death synth um, as a way to just try to get away from any like sort of other people's uh, uh, idolations of, you know, what should be this or what is this or what because I hate those conversations um and what that did is it kind of gave me the freedom to just do whatever the hell I wanted to do um if I wanted to write something angry I would write something angry um if I wanted to write a black metal song I'd write a black metal song if I wanted to write you know a punk song I'd write a punk song sure. um so with filth it was sort of my uh jumping into just trying to get out what I whatever I was feeling and however that turned out like the first song on the album is kind of more of like a black metal song I don't know why that happened <laughs> the way that it did and then there were other songs do a bunch of different things uh, when I got away from that I went into um just trying to see what else I could do I was listening to a lot of 80s uh music a lot of synth wave a lot of goth music stuff like that and that turned into um the the next EP um the inevitability of nothing. Yeah. And that was just my way of writing something that I hadn't written before, mainly just to see if I could. And two, just because it just sounded like that's how that emotion and that particular theme should sound. Um, so by the time I'd gotten into the new flesh, it was sort of one of these things where um, I was so used to writing groups of uh, music that had a general theme. Filth had a general theme. Um, the inevitability of nothing had a general theme. And so I could just kind of got to the idea, well, okay, I'm just gonna release an album of just songs and I'm not going to make them mean anything particularly. You know, it's not necessarily an overall theme. It's just going to be whatever the hell it is I want it to be. Um, and this was around the time everybody, you know, we were all locked down. There was nothing else going on. Right. So I went to, um, I have a vault of songs upon songs some stuff is finished some stuff isn't i figured okay i'll just take some of this stuff i'll fuck around with it i'll just do some random things i'll just have fun and see what happens um and what was funny was that i didn't necessarily mean for those songs to be cohesive i didn't necessarily mean for that album to have this uh uh unified sound but i just went back and listened to it like a week ago I thought, oh, well, this is a lot more cohesive than I thought it was. That's kind of interesting. That wasn't the plan. This was literally the first album where I was just like, fuck it. I'm just going to do whatever I feel like doing at the time. And I'm just going to leave it there. I think I have a habit of trying to really craft things and make it like deep and complex. Like in Filth, um, there's like, like hidden messages and like weird things and stuff that you find if you like separate the tracks and all these different types of things. And um yeah, the new flesh was just like, fuck it. I'm just going to do, you know, everything. It's just face value. It just is what it is. And I'm just going to have fun and throw it out there and see what happens. And I think sometimes, you know, especially if you're going from album to album that way, 
it makes the mysteries more mysterious. Because if all of a sudden if people are used to maybe there's these little tiny aspects and these brush strokes and you can find them if you dig, dig deep enough to look, and then you turn around and just put out an album that is exactly what it looks like and coming right down your throat with, you know, teeth and fire, that it it makes you think, well, am I missing something? Is there something else going on here? And I, I think that adds a lot of power to it that anytime you can have dramatic contrast between albums like that, I think it adds power to both, you know, because you're stretching it a little further. Yeah, I did I did manage to uh get a little sum of that in there because I just can't help myself. And uh one of the songs that just doesn't have a title, it's just because I thought that'd be funny that it would just have a song that has no title. Um there's a backwards message in there but if you just reverse it it says sometimes there's no meaning because there just isn't I, awesome. it's just nothing so it was mainly for people i guess if anybody happens to be a fan which i don't think i have any fans but if there are happen to be fans who you know take the time to try to find all the backwards things and all the hidden messages they would find that and just be like oh well, you just wasted your time because sometimes <laughs> there's just no meaning that's just how it is gallows humor love it what inspired you to add Easter eggs? Like, are you big into puzzles or like video games? Um, I'm extremely inspired by um, the 80s and the 90s. Um, and I always say that I think my music's a little dated because I just can never get out of that. That's just where I live. And this is just where I'll die in the 80s and 90s. But, um, you know, I was always obsessed with the, you know, by the time like the Satanic Panic came out, and people were always afraid of everything and, you know, all these albums. And if you played them backwards, terrible things would happen. And so, you know, bands started doing that just to be funny. Or, you know, you would listen to an album and there'd be 99 tracks for some reason. And on the 99th track, there'd be, you know, something. But on, you know, all the other tracks, it was total silence. Or you'd find little hidden things. Or if you put the CD into a computer, you know, it would play a hidden video that wasn't on there. Or just little things like that. I think that... um having that level of interaction with music um especially if you're doing something on a on a bigger scale uh it helps it kind of pulls people into that world which is uh something that i've always been about this world building which is essentially what a helvet inc is anyway it's trying to um create this uh a, a world that centers on the the facets of mental illness and and characterizing that what it is so i figured if i made little easter eggs or you know i would post pictures and there'd be little things hidden in pictures or little characters or you know i would type things or put them you know out online or whatever and sometimes if you move the letters around you'll find certain things it's just a way to you know chase go down that rabbit hole and see how far it takes you Nice. Like, I was going to ask um, why you chose, like, the Norwegian version of Hell as, like, the term for, like, your band and stuff. Like, um, is it because you're inspired by the black metal scene or is there some other, like, story that goes along with it? Um, I think that hell is just a blunt word in of itself um and yeah I, I think i even know the word helvet exists because of black metal and it wasn't necessarily that i was trying to go back to that but i've always just liked that sound or the way that that said i mean hell is just so blunt and it's just there and it has all of this connotation helvet kind of it has finesse and it's somewhat subversive because if you don't know what it is then you have no idea you know what that's about until you look it up and i kind of like making people do a little work or misleading them so um a lot of times uh when i first uh, started releasing stuff people thought i was like a black metal band and like i got reviewed in like black metal places and people were like but what the hell is this this is really soft or black is like this is not black metal but people just assumed and i didn't bother to correct it so it's just it was kind of one of those subversive things if you listen to it or if you see the name and you think it's a black metal band i'm not going to correct you if you don't even know what hell that means i'm not going to correct you you'll figure it out eventually I think the other power of that and what's really cool is the idea, and it's such a simple little thing, but adding in INC incorporated on it. So you're kind of talking about hell that, or this idea of hell, but on top of that, adding kind of this capitalist ideal on top of, um, you know, the, the concept of hell. And 
what was your intent with that or, or how did that really come to your mind <laughs> it's funny that um i kind of thought that it was funny to be in the business of sort of like manufacturing and creating hell um you know this world that i was building this what i was trying to convey to people what was you know what was in my head and the things that were going on i was piecing this together and i thought it kind of funny to make it this uh structural business type thing where you know i could have you know named myself you know a basket of dead puppies or you know something edgy but i just thought okay well it's hell but it's sort of hell structured it's hell you know no, incorporated it's it's a refined version of hell for maximum punch so i thought helvet inc was sort of kind of like a, a it's punk yet business at the same time and i kind of appreciated that yeah i i think when i heard it too i kind of took this uh barker kind of idea away from it is not only are you in this torture or this hell that but you're paying for the pleasure of it and and i think that's to me something that really struck me when i first heard this and first read the name is this idea of we do not only do we torture ourselves in this way but we get off on it in a way that we you know it's kind of asking for it and i i don't know i just always thought that was a really interesting way to you know have a band name and um so very cool there it's funny because it's kind of taken on its own thing um after uh, the new flesh because i had done a lot of work for that i was kind of burned out um because I made music literally is just kind of like a oral suicide note in case, you know, something ever happened. Somebody at least would hear what was going on in my head and I got to say it. However, when you release things and you want people to buy it, then it becomes a business. And then there's a lot of, that you have to do. And then you have to do interviews and you have to, you know, do videos and you have to think about, you know, publishing rights and, and labels and all of these things. And it just, I'm not really into the business side um, but when you're the only person in the band, you kind of have to be. So it did kind of become its own hell, which was kind of funny that Helvet Egg just became literally just this business that I was pumping out that became insufferable because just like I can't stand, you know, watching metrics and watching money and watching all of these things because it just it it that especially after uh, uh, um, the last album, it just literally became its own hell in a corporate sense. Yeah, I feel you on that. You know, Katie could tell you too, just the sheer, when people want to buy, say, a Sounds and Shadows t-shirt, and I'm like, oh, fuck, I have to fucking mail something to someone? Oh. And it, it's just, <laughs> so I hear you on that. It just becomes, I don't know, when you when you monetize something like art, it, it is, it is like a special kind of torture for yourself. <laughs> um, you're there in the baltimore maryland scene correct yes so we got some other friends there like uh steven and donna archer and and other bands that you know we talk to and work with a lot tell me a little bit about uh the baltimore maryland scene and and how it is and i mean when it actually exists i understand there is no scene anywhere at this exact moment but in general i think i'm the worst person to ask about that um because i just I've never really felt a part of any sort of scene or any sort of community or any sort of anything. And when I did music, um, I originally wrote Filth as just literally for myself. It was never meant to go anywhere. Um, I had recorded it at uh, Manta Ray Records and the owner liked it so much. He was like, well, you know, we can distribute it. We can do things. And I'm like, people want to hear this shit. All right, sure. Fuck it. Why not? Um, and I had done a drag show. It's like, uh, music slash drag slash sideshow uh, thing with uh, Jenny from uh, Fun Never Starts. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's one of the local industrial bands. And um, it was in that moment that I kind of decided like, oh, maybe I should do this live. You know, maybe there should be a live band. Maybe there should be something other than just me releasing stuff and, you know, just letting it fall into the void. So it kind of developed that way. Um, but I was never in the scene, so to speak. Um, I barely even went to shows. I don't like leaving my house. And it's not that I don't support other people. I still buy their music and do other things. It's just, I don't like people and I stay <laughs> in my room as much as possible. So when it, uh, you know, when we're talking about a scene and, and the other bands, um, the people I know like Hemlock, um, 
you know, um, from Sister Sarah yeah. and, um, and Stone Burner, um, people that I just happened to know throughout nightlife. I think mostly through drag and other things because I had to be social. But then once I stopped doing that, I kind of just pulled myself out of every everything. So I'm kind of detached from whatever is going on in Baltimore, unfortunately. Well, if you spend a bunch of time at home, I have to ask, is there anything that you've gotten into outside of your music? Like, are there any shows that you've gotten really into or any books that you've read that you'd recommend for people? Hmm. Um, I have essentially just been falling down this rabbit hole of um producing and learning how to like you know do uh mixes how to do like production how to do my own stuff like that so i just like watch youtube videos <laughs> things like that i'm an extremely boring person i think that people think that there's always like some mystical thing that goes on like no most of the time i'm either watching like zombie movies or porn or figuring out how to make music or like downloading weird things like faces of death or something so i could turn it into samples of <laughs> the most boring creature in existence all of that sounds like not boring creature stuff i like that like okay so when you're watching like you like zombie movies is that like your horror movie like slam dunk right there like do you or do, are you just a big horror fan i'm a big uh horror fan um 80s Sorry. horror it, uh plus because you know horror, horror i think peaked in the 80s because it was just maximum stupid and that's kind of how i liked it and i grew up on trash cinema as a kid in the 80s and 90s with like ronda shears up all night and trauma movies and like you know elvira and you know uh uh um, these types of people. So it's pretty much just what I watch and what I focus on. Um, I do enjoy uh, various like queer punk films, um, uh, like Bruce LaBruce movies, Greg Araki movies, things like that. Things that are just really subversive and just weird. Um, like the, the uh, guy who made Gummo and like, those types of just weird, just off the wall movies that I just, you know, like. Oh man, Greg Araki, I like, never really got into his stuff until i started dating my current boyfriend and he's like you have to see uh doom generation and that kind of changed my entire world and same with like nobody's like that yeah. <laughs> yeah i think everybody i think everybody somehow saw doom generation first no matter how many movies this man makes everybody's <laughs> first introduction to him is somehow always doom generation and uh it, it started my obsession with james duvall because oh, i'm God. just obsessed with him i he know was like the quintessential like metalhead slash like cute dumb industrial boy that i'm just like i i appreciate your existence no one wears a sad dumb face like that man exactly <laughs> all right awesome um okay well as being a music review page, that's what we do a lot. One of the things I always like asking guests is, give me three things that you're listening to right now. What gets you excited? Mm, that's interesting. Um, Greg Pusiato's uh, album, um, Child Soldier, Enemy of God. Um, I think he used to be the singer for Dillinger Escape Plan or something like that. I never really listened to Dillinger Escape Plan, but uh, he made this album that is literally just whatever the fuck he felt like doing from track to track. Sometimes you get synth wave, sometimes you get metal, sometimes you get like these weird like Janet Jackson soulful interludes yeah. and a lot of like synth and industrial. It is just amazing. I love that I cannot get enough of it. It was my favorite album of last year by far. Um, beyond that, people will probably be surprised to know that um, a lot of what I've been listening to is Shaka Khan lately. Um, I am a massive Shaka Khan fan, um, which it, uh, in odd ways, it seeped into my own music. Um, and so anything by her is just what I'm listening to. Um, I'm going back mainly to her like Rufus Days um, and a lot of those albums. So anything by Shaka Khan. And uh, three, I've been listening to and everyone's going to roll their eyes in unison, but a lot of Trent Reznor as of late. Um, mainly just because I am in love with the way that he layers things and, and his uh, intricacies when it comes to songwriting. And when I'm working on my own stuff, it's kind of an inspiration so that I don't, 
you know, make my stuff too stupid. <laughs> I think I have to smarten it up. So if I listen to him and he makes me feel dumb, then I know I need to go back and get my shit together. Nice. I, I think all three of those are, and, and they give an interesting perspective. I'll ask one more related um, because you've talked a couple times about, you know, doing drag shows and performing in that way. What kind of stuff did you use to play as music when you would perform drag? Um, so it's funny. I never really cared about drag. I never really cared about clubs. I never really cared about any of that shit um, because they, I never really felt like I belonged in those places. So whenever I uh, wanted to do drag, I just decided, OK, I'm going to be the kind of person I wish I would have wanted to see going to those clubs. So I would just do random stuff. I would do, you know, ministry. I would do like Manson. Sometimes I would do like old 1950 songs just because I could. I would yeah. just try to do, or I would take uh, pop songs that were current. Because one of the things that I hate is that whenever you have a, some pop diva that comes out with a new song, that means you have to hear it over and over and over because every drag queen is going to do it because nobody has originality apparently. So I would try to do the exact same thing that they were doing, only ruin it by doing something completely horrible while the song is playing so that hopefully I could just like fucking ruin it for everybody. So whenever they hear that song, it just scars them. Um, so it was kind of that thing. I would just kind of purposely choose things that I knew would scare the living hell out of people um, because they were an easy bunch to scare because they're not used to anything. Right. They just came there to woo, you know, and yeah, weren't ready to, to see something intense like that. That's awesome. Um, kind of going along with that then. So are you saying that you don't really do much or haven't to perform live ever with this project? Um, I didn't plan to, but people had somewhat of an interest in it. Um, maybe I'm just naive or maybe it's whatever it is, but I just kind of, I'm always surprised that people are even paying it a bit of attention at all. Um, I didn't think anybody wanted to hear it until, you know, the guy that owns the label said that people wanted to hear it. I didn't think anybody wanted to see me live or even gave a shit until people expressed interest. Yeah. Um, we've done two shows. We did an album release show when Filth came out and then a uh, show uh, a little bit before the whole, you know, uh, worldwide shutdown happened, um, which was sad because I'd been planning on a tour um, I was going to do this festival, this uh, metal festival um, in South Dakota and some other things, but everything got shut down. So when things open back up again, I guess I have no choice but to, uh, you know, get out there and, and, and do shows and whatnot. See, because to me, I mean, that's just it, especially the, the people you cite, you know, like the G.G. Allen or, you know, his influences in this were very visual performers and their connection to the the music that they're doing and i see that from you just this I, I know you're saying you're a very solitary person but just give off this this energy that i imagine would would be a very electric show what what would that look like to you what what do you think is the best way to express um you know helvet ink music in a visual format <laughs> Uh, I, don't, I don't think we could get away with half of the things. Um, <laughs> I kind of wanted to take a lot of what I did in a drag capacity and um, just performance wise, some of the things that I've done. Um, a lot of the things I've done were kind of social experiments and other things and kind of move them into um, a more theatrical sort of uh, live presentation. Um, so I got a band. And mainly it was funny because my band always jokes that, you know, I could replace them with a tape recorder, which is kind of funny because it was kind of one of those things where it's like, okay, we've got backing tracks. We have other things. I don't really have a drummer. I have a keyboardist and I have other things. I would like a drummer somewhere down the line, but we haven't gotten there yet. But it's just kind of one of those things where I felt like a band made for a better aesthetic than just me behind a microphone. Um, I kind of liked that idea of, you know, four or five guys on stage, you know, doing you know this this thing and creating this uh music um the shows that we have done have have uh were certainly memorable for various reasons i don't know there's just a lot of malfunctions and a lot of breaking things and uh it's, it's just a lot of <laughs> just things breaking and things burning and and, and self-mutilation and all sorts of things happening 
So I think it would be more of that, but just on a grander scale. Nice. So getting into now, because like I said, I mean, I've had, I love when I do this with a band where I have an opportunity where I've, I've heard three of your albums now and kind of watched a progression happen, listen to it. And the new one that you've sent me, the inevitability of nothing, um, is a flipped on its head, bold shift from anything that I'd heard from you before. And honestly, and maybe that's just me because I'm, I don't have that many metal roots. It's the one that I like best by far. It, it just really, I mean, spoke to, and, and the other thing, in a lot of your previous albums, per the industrial sound or the metal sound, you have a lot of effects on your voice. You know, there's a lot of broken glass in it, a lot of anger in it. And in this one, I got to really hear you sing and your voice is amazing. It just has this deep, powerful resonance. It carries the entire bass line along with it and kind of melds with the bass line and becomes a part of it. Um, what is it that you, you feel like was this change that you wanted to get across or say with the inevitability of nothing? Um, what's funny about that is that I'll just say outright every time I listen to that, all I can think about is uh, what would happen if Rick Astley decided to do a Helvetic uh, album. Because to me, that's just what I sound like. But um, it was around the time I was making that, um, I was listening to a lot of goth music, a lot of 80s music, a lot of things like that. Yeah. Um, and I was also at a point where I was used to writing these uh, uh, aggressive and abrasive, like transgressive type songs, whether it be metal and then, you know, went into filth and uh, things like that. And I thought, I'm going to challenge myself in different ways, even with filth, like um, this first single, uh, Godless Even Fuck Machine, was kind of... I fucking love that song. And I, I love the name of it, too. Sorry. That's just great. Godless <laughs> That, that should be on every bumper sticker. I thought so. and um, But it was my way of kind of writing a hit um, because the, when I was in a metal band, you know, you don't do that. You just, you right. know, put on a bunch of blast beats and add a million notes a second, scream your head off and sing about, you know, dead puppies or whatever. And um, you're not really trying to reach uh, uh, a broader range of people. Um, so after Filth, even that was sort of a way to try to reach a different uh, range of people that I normally wouldn't have tried before because Godless Heathen Fuck Machine is kind of was my first attempt at writing a hit, even though I named it that on purpose, kind of, I guess, to be self-defeating. But um, when The Inevitability of Nothing, or Tion for short, um, came out, it was a way to take what I was doing and to take the same message. And I thought, okay, I'll try something different. I'll release this and it's a bit softer. Um, it's a bit more accessible and to see if people enjoy it, to see, you know, what people's reactions are. Um, I think especially with my music, I try to gauge what people's reactions are um, to see what they respond to and what they don't respond to. So it's my way of branching out and doing something I hadn't done before, as well as trying to just reach a different audience with the same message. Nice. I, uh, to me, I think that's just it. Like, I try as a music reviewer to to branch out, and even if something is, frankly, just a little too hard for me. And, and I'll tell you, when I first heard your first album, that was just it. I liked it, and it was well done, but I knew I was in over my head. Like, this, this was too hard for what my normal tastes are in listening. And I'll tell you, I mean, that this is something that is utterly accessible for me, like it has a lot of edge still it's a velvet glove coated in broken glass and it still has those sharp edges and that power but there is a subtlety to it and and a smoothness to it that i just really enjoyed and found myself falling into on the album um so going forward then i mean do you think this is a one-off from you and and now it's something where yeah you did it just like you said you kind of just wanted to prove to yourself that you could. And I'll tell you, you did. You, you pulled that off. Um, do you think it's something that still interests you? Or are you one of those that I did it, 
like throw the grenade behind you and fucking walk away as the building blows mm-hmm. up and just walk on and move on to the next thing. Are we going to get a fusion jazz album from you next? I mean, you might. It's funny that even when I'm writing songs, I don't know what the hell they're going to be. Um, I didn't just sit down and say, oh, I'm just going to make this, you know, goth wave album. I had no idea what the hell was going to happen. I think the first song just kind of came about. I think it might have been Fades to White that I did. And I was looking at it like, what the fuck is this? What am I going to do with this? With What did I just do? And then I was listening to other music and it just turned into that. Um, so that album came out before um, The New Flesh. So it was just me doing a bunch of different things to see if I could. Um, I don't plan on going back to it. But I mean, like I said, I don't know how I'm going to feel from one moment to the next. And I can't write the same song twice, at least at at least not that I know of. Maybe people think all oh, my shit sounds the same. But for me, I'm never in the same mental space twice. So I, I don't think I could go back and do that again because it's just not where I was. Um, I did. Uh, it's coming out again because I remastered it and added two um, additional tracks um, that were songs that were also written in that time period that was sort of for that, but they just didn't make it for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And um, I wanted to go back and clean some things up and sort of revisit it and i think it was kind of one of those eps that people i don't want to say ignored but they didn't really know what to do with and um you know coming off of filth people like what the hell is that like or is this what you're going to be doing from now on it's just like no i don't know what the hell i'm going to be doing from now on so but now that i have kind of a general idea um i just you know touched it up added the two extra songs and then put it out there um you know again so that people can, I guess, uh, enjoy it, uh, you know, if they missed it the first time. If I'm going back to it, I, I honestly don't know. <laughs> I'd never say never, but I, I never know. And I think part of that is the world has changed now, and it used to be a lot more. I mean, I say this, you're, the place that you're in, and then you're building out as, you know, from the physical location that you are you know, was the way in the 90s or the 80s or whatever. And nowadays, it's a lot more about genre. And so if you're kind of known for and done in a particular style or what people expect to hear from you, yeah, if you do a fucking 180 like that, like you did, the the normal methods that you get to get your music out to people aren't the same, right? I mean, you're not reaching for the same ears necessarily, or maybe you are, you know, in the sense that you wanted metal fans or hardcore industrial fans to say, I need you to hear this other aspect, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, (laughs) it's kind of funny that, um, I sometimes just purposely make things just to fuck with people. Um, one of the songs in filth, i put in a bunch of gay porn noises just because I wanted that to fuck with whoever was listening to it to try to like run to the radio or to stereo or whatever and turn it down. Um, So I kind of like doing things just to mess with people. Um, And I remember when Filth came out and people were like, well, when are we going to get another one? When are we going to get another one? And I didn't uh, ever want to be one of those bands to just write the same song for 30 years. Yeah. And just kind of coast on it, which if some people do, that's fine. But um, that's just not something that I wanted to do and i think i have this weird chip on my shoulder about uh, proving that i can be i guess a competent musician or do different things not that anybody said that i couldn't i think it's just the voices in my head telling me that i'm shit and i need to do these things to you know flex that i can do things that nobody asked me to do but um yeah um it was just one of those things where I'm just like okay i'll make this um, I know it's going to fuck with people because people are expecting filth and they're going to get this. And people did ask me like, is, is this what you're doing from now on? Like, yeah, sure. Let's go with that. Well, yeah, this is what I'm doing from now on. And then, you know, I release, you know, an album like the new flesh and it sounds nothing like that one. It's just like, yeah. So hope, hopefully they get that. I can just do whatever the hell I want to do when I feel like doing it. I love that idea of, I just got this total picture in my head of like these two bros, you know, metal heads, like with, you know, long ass hair and sitting there like, yeah. And then just gay porn. And they're like, wait, is that two guys fucking? Is that what's happening? (laughs) Fuck. I love it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, as much as, uh, you know, I, I, develop that sense of i don't know shock and and ridiculousness from you know people like Gigi allen or uh, edwin borsheim and different types of people that 
it's unfortunate that in this day and age, nothing's really shocking anymore. Sure. Um, nothing really gets to people um, because they're so desensitized to things. So I kind of just like making things that, even if they aren't necessarily shocking in the greater sense, they still fuck with people. Just, you know, like that song. You know, you're listening to an album, all of a sudden there's gay porn noises. Or you're yeah. listening to my catalog, and all of a sudden there's this guy that sounds like Rick, Rick Ashley singing a goth song. You have no idea where the fuck that came from. And it's just, you know, it may not, you know, uh, make the PMRC, you know, hold a Congress meeting about me, but it at least freaks people out and makes them wonder what the fuck is going on, which is, you know, something I like to do. Yeah. Really like that too. It's just kind of like being funny for yourself for the sake of being funny. I love that. And it's those type of things that like when somebody does find those little, oh my God, my dog is just looking at his food dish crying because it's empty. <laughs> I know I'm the sorry. feeling. If, <laughs> if so, hold on. Zoro. It's okay. I just... <laughs> you know what? Ken, take over for a second. I'm I need you to do me a favor. I need you to just uh, give the dog the headphones and put the dog in your chair and you can just leave and we'll just talk to the dog. I like... Can we, can we just can talk we to the dog? the dog, Katie? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Come on. I'm surprised none of my cats have attacked me tonight. Usually they do whenever I'm doing an interview. They all want to come be... Uh, you know, famous in the internet. Can we can we just interview the dog now? Can this just be about the dog, it is please? A cute dog. <laughs> yes, I would like to inter interview the dog. Yeah, yeah please, uh, STR. Please have some questions for the dog. Yes. Um, so um, I understand that you were very prominent in the CBGB scene in the seventies. Can you tell us a little about that? It was wild, man. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. We're, we're so glad to have you with us. It's great, but I gotta go and smoke a cigarette or something. I'm a wild dude. It's a good one, Zorro. Here. Oh, Zorro. Um, well, important follow-up question there. I mean, you said, you know, you spend a lot of time there uh, yourself. Do, do you have any pets that you'd like to talk to us yeah. about? Yeah. Um, I do. I have a dog. His name is Kobe, um, also known as uh, You Fucking Idiot. Um, and he's around here somewhere. I don't know, probably in the kitchen making himself a sandwich or something. The dog eats constantly. Um, you know, I, I, I love dogs. I'm a fan of animals. I kind of like animals more than people. So, you know, they're always good to have around. That's what Tell Betty White Kobe. says about stuff too. Like she's always been a big animal rights person and then never had kids because she likes animals more than people. But yeah. Tell us about Kobe like a proud parent, please. Uh, what his uh, favorite food is, what his activities are. Um, we need to know more about your dog. Yeah. Um, his favorite food is everything. Um, his favorite activity is getting on my goddamn nerves. And um, he's just this lazy piece of shit that for some reason I adore and I hold in higher regard than uh, human beings. And I appreciate him, even if I threaten to kill him on a daily basis. And I'm pretty sure if he could talk, he would threaten to kill me too. At least he's honest about it though. You know, sure. when he's being a piece of shit, I mean, it's straight up looking you at in the eyes to your face. Like I would trade you for a bowl of food right now, you know? But people, they, they come at you a different way. Exactly. Which is why, you know, I appreciate him. I kind of wish he could talk sometimes just so that, you know, he could curse me out and say terrible things because I'm sure he wants to. I'm pretty sure if I was my dog and I had to live with me, I would be very angry. I'm angry just being me and having to live with me. So I can only imagine what he must feel like. Okay. Do you ever do a voice for your dog? And if so, could you do the voice for your dog as if he's asking you to take him for a walk which is funny i normally i uh, know i don't uh do a voice for him um i think his silence is just more interesting because sometimes you could just tell what he's thinking and when it doesn't have a voice to it it just comes off as a lot more comical <laughs> it's kind of like snoopy or something like that yeah my cats have a voice and we have voices for them all and they you know yell at us usually they're after actors or actresses or something that we come up with them and usually they involve a lot of disdain my cats have a lot of like you can see it in their face like especially like kappa just 
can look at you and throw the worst side eye and just wither me with her hatred. I can feel it. Aren't all cats like that? Cats are just hate everything, which is, I, I kind of, I appreciate them for that. They are just these angry, hate-filled balls of just fluff. And I, I, I empathize with that. I know what that's like. So, yeah. I just think of them as like a bag of knives. Like they're like a bag of knives with fur on them. My cat is so mean. My cats for two of my cats are very loving and very caring and, and not mean at all and have no disdain. Like Freya in particular, my three-legged one, um, she loves everybody and loves life and is just like excited just to be here all the time. Um, let's, uh, let's steer it back here, SCR, because I'd like to go out on playing a track um, off uh, the inevitability of nothing. And I have a few that I like here, but to me, I'd like to hear from you. What is the track that you think I don't, is, is the one that best encapsulates this album or idea for you? Hmm. Um, I have my favorite track, which is yeah. honestly the, my, the, um, my favorite song I've ever done. Um, well, let's play is, that. <laughs> which is uh, Light Falls Apart, where it's not necessarily uh, deep lyrically, but in the theme of the story, it kind of just tells what it is. And that was the first time I think I've ever written anything that really sounded like the emotion I was trying to get out. So even now, like that's my, that's my favorite song I've ever done. That's awesome. I, we will play that to go out. Do you have, uh, this has been great talking to you. Um, I, I feel like we got a, a great grasp. And I mean, we talk online a fair amount, but I've never really got a chance to speak with you face to face before. So this has been wonderful. Do you have any parting shots or parting thoughts for our listeners? Um, listen to my music, please. Um, I think anybody, I think anybody who has, um, I don't get to say it as uh, often as I probably should. Um, you know, I'm thankful for um, all the reviewers and magazines and radios and, you know, anybody that's ever at least acknowledged my existence in some way, shape or form. Um, so if anything, I just want to thank everybody. And even if you're watching this or listening to this or whatever you may be doing, if you're paying me any sort of attention at all, um, you know, thank you for that. And um, yeah, go buy my shit so that I can make some more. Beautiful. Katie, parting thoughts? I just want to say thank you for talking with us today. Uh, you are a beautiful person that's put out beautiful music, whether it be something that's a little bit more thrashy or your new stuff that's like very easy to listen to. You're putting out fucking amazing tracks and i hope that you never stop because the scene really needs this it needs like the like multitude of sounds that you're putting out to make it into a bigger thing than it currently is which is already a big thing it's just like i'm really really glad to have talked to you today i'm really excited for what's to come i'm super stoked that you're out and in baltimore and we can potentially play shows together in the future you should you should come out to kalamazoo i'll feed your ass it'll be delicious yeah uh, you can pet my I dog will definitely in real do shows. i will definitely do shows for food i've done stranger things for food so definitely i will i have no shame i will do that it's hard same all right well this has been sounds and shadows uh with uh helvet inc and str helvet everybody out there uh, the track that we're going to listen to is called Light Falls Apart and Keep It Fucking Dark, Yeah. <laughs>